But this is a story about the basically the Hefke uh, initiative at Oxford. So before the REF policy, we were busy with the RCUK work and the, we had an open access project group set up. So we were, we were up and running already and we had an APC processing service that was set up at the start of the RCUK initiative. So that was already going. Um, being Oxford, uh, you know, why have one tool when you can have lots and lots of them across the university? <laughs> so we had multiple deposit tools going on, which was something of a challenge. And generally, there was very little engagement with green deposit across the university at that time. And then, of course, the, how we love it, the um, Hefke Open Access Policy came out, which was great. And um, again, implementation of this was governed by the Open Access Project Group, which was already up and running at quite a high level, and had um, representation from research services, from all the academic divisions, which was really important that we had representation of the academics there, even though it was administrative people who were on the, on the committee there, and the libraries and IT services and so on. So it was very much a bringing together of these diff different services, which we've heard quite a bit about in the last two speakers. And the idea of this, um, this group is that it looked at all open access, not just HEFKE. And we set up a project, uh, the Open Access Service Design Project, to look at how best we could fulfill the uh, compliance for the HEFKE policy and the others as well while we were going along. Uh, the co collaboration there is uh, listed, Research Services Bodleian, um, academic divisions and departments, the colleges, of course, who we also have to include and which are separate to the university, and our planning and resource allocation people, who are actually the sort of hefty reporting gurus. And the idea was that we would do some investigations and pilots to work out what was the best way to go forward with this across the university. And uh, because we had all these different deposit mechanisms, we had to kind of try and come up with one place and one way that we could do this, which I should say is very, very unusual for Oxford. Normally, everybody is let go to go on their own uh, devices and how best they want to, but we really wanted to bring this together. So the outputs uh, of this particular project was a detailed report and service recommendations and a very, very detailed communications plan. I was interested to see the imperial communications plan because we've got something as long, great big spreadsheet with the communications that we, we will be uh, doing for getting engagement. So really the communications was key to underpinning all of this and this great sort of communications machine cranked into action which involved all our subject libraries any methods of communication we could possibly lay our hands on um, including online help where people can tap into our library uh, staff there asking questions online if they want to and like everyone else, we had set up an open access website. This was just aimed at open access and isn't actually interlinked with our research data management website. But it seems to be working quite well. It was set up a little while back for RCUK and a lot of people are using it. It's getting a lot of hits. And the idea is that simple questions can be answered there and there's basic information about all the different policies up there, you know, the policies that confuse all our academics. And we decided that we needed um, a really good strap line. We came up with our, our snappy act on acceptance strap line, which was basically just telling everybody what they had to do in three words and to try and ding that message home for them. So we had this simple, single message which we could bandy about the entire university. We wanted a very simple interface um, so that when they did act on acceptance, it was easy for them and simple actions for them to do, basically with the burden being taken by the bodily and not by the academics individually. And we went live with our new Act on Acceptance service on the 1st of October. Um, the idea was to give us a six-month ramp-up before the Hefke policy really started to kick in. Along that time, the communications machine still sort of inexorably uh, trundles along, trying to get people on board. You always find somebody who hasn't heard about what's going on at every single meeting you go to. Oh, really? You have to do that. Um, and then behind the scenes, the Bodleian is, uh, well, it's very much the, you know, the image of the swan and the academic being 
smoothly going on across the top and then the paddling furiously underneath is within the body and libraries where our staff edit and enhance metadata that's coming in and we have staff there to, to actually run the service because the service is not just the technology, mm -hmm. it is the people behind it as well. And the um, decision was taken that people, it, that was in the pilot service, people would have to deposit via our instance of Symplectic. Um, and for that, because everybody had been doing something different, we had to make sure that by the 1st of October, everybody who wanted one could have um, a Symplectic account, because not everybody had one beforehand. And this, <laughs> this should be a bit of a sense of deja vu. This is our deposit form, which has four mandatory fields, which looks very similar to the, uh, the imperial deposit form. We took the decision that this is all we were going to ask of our authors, four fields. And you actually find that um, in meetings now, you go along to them and people say, oh, it's far too difficult. I don't, I don't want to be able to do this. And usually you get an academic pops up and says, I've done it. It's only four fields. It's really very easy. And you know, at that point, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what the Bodleian is doing behind the scenes. This is the swan's feet paddling underneath the water. We're doing the version check. We're doing, checking funder and grant details. Uh, the publisher <coughs> statement, we're trying to put that in. Checking permissions. This will be familiar, I expect, to a lot of you there. Uh, forwarding APC queries to our APC team and updating records as and when we need to. And the progress has been good. Uh, we're trying to monitor engagement, and that's hopefully happening within the academic departments, not necessarily via the Bodleian. Um, an interesting area that we're discussing is that of um, responsibilities. You know, for example, if uh, a researcher deposits the wrong version of um, an article into our system, and our review team go back to that person and says, <coughs> you've deposited the wrong version, you need to do something about this. If they then don't deposit the right version, whose responsibility then is to continue policing that and chasing it up? So we've been having some interesting discussions around all these different points of compliance and whose responsibility, whether it's the Bodleian to do this, the individual academic, the academic divisions, or PRAS to chase this up. Um, our college-only staff of all nearly got accounts. I did do a bit of naming and shaming a few weeks ago, but hopefully they're all there now. And we have seen um, a complete change in the numbers of deposits into our repository. This is a graph showing here last August and September where we were with deposits into the repository via Symplectic. And we were about 100 a month, which for a University Oxford size is not particularly good, really. And then we launched Act and Acceptance and well, hey, we were quite pleased to see that uh, deposits went up. And you can see from there, although there was a dip around Christmas time, we didn't know what would happen then, whether people would um, suddenly find they'd got some time to deposit or they would go and eat their Christmas dinner instead. Um, it did reduce a bit. But you can see that by February, um, we were getting really quite a lot of deposits. And we had uh, 1,100 deposits in February, which works out at about uh, 300 um, per month, uh, sorry, per week, if uh, we were going on that figure. I should say the caveats here that this is all types of deposits. People are using this deposit to not deposit not only accepted manuscripts, but also some are putting their back catalogue in. And it doesn't include theses, which are coming in via a different route. No, never have one, can you? Um, this, just to give a bit of context, is the size of the operation at Oxford or estimated size for some of this. Uh, we've got a lot of research active staff, uh, a lot of research income, people very busy, and we think, although this is something of a wet finger in the air, that we will expect about 16,000 peer-reviewed items a year. Um, nobody really knows. Uh, we hopefully in a year's time will have a bit more of an idea. But given those figures, um, we are estimating about 300 items a week coming into the repository, which is what we were in February. And March is keeping up with the February figures as far as we can tell so far. So we have got a problem of working at scale here. We have got a lot of people and a lot of stuff to deal with. 
I've put down at the bottom there the number of linked orchids. It has actually gone up to about 2,400 now. Um, and we're trying uh, to get everybody to get an orchid and link it to the Oxford services <laughs> so that we can, um, we can make things easier in future. And these are some of the challenges of working at scale, that anything that has a workaround becomes incredibly labour-intensive. Uh, we're trying to manage APCs with many different models, which becomes uh, very difficult for our APC staff. And we also still have a situation where a lot of the APC payments are not hitting the Bodleian. They're still uh, processed within academic departments where people have got, um, say, uh, funding grants with, with APC payments still in there. So there's a lot not coming our way that we don't know about. Um, I started writing this, and as I was going down the, the list... The, the text was getting smaller and smaller and smaller as I added things to it. So this is just a, a select few. We've got a lot of things that we have got to try and deal with. Um, conference papers are one thing which our reviewers are finding take a heck of a long time to sort out, just finding information about what's going on for a conference item. We've got these horrendous workarounds which we have got to try and iron out in the coming months. Um, we're very much looking forward with Glee to um, setting exceptions because uh, this, this will cause a lot of problems with that, uh, that um, responsibilities that, that I was talking about. You know, the different exceptions that HEFCI will allow, there are different points in the service where they will be flagged up, you know, sometimes by the <coughs> academics, sometimes by our reviewers, sometimes by our um, administrative staff in the departments. And we need to make sure we iron out exactly where they're going to be flagged up and then flagged on the actual item. We need to do this at the point of deposit because nobody's going to remember in five years time. So um, we, oh well you can read all that for yourselves but there are a lot of problems there and streamlining the service I think is one of the things which we really want to do and you know must take absolute priority to try and reduce the time for everybody basically. Uh, this is a bit of a facile slide, but, you know, basically this is what we want. We want automation all the way so that we can work at scale. And I know this is too small. I'm going to break this down in a minute. But I put together a bit of a picture as to how um, a, a workflow might work from the point of view of the academic, really, um, from the point of submission to getting stuff into the repository. So basically, at the beginning there... The author submits their article to a publisher's system, and at that point, lots of identifiers get cranked up. So all the authors have an ORCID, and we've got Fundref going in, and all different identifiers there. We've got the publisher's data going in there, like ISSNs and information um, about that particular article. And from there, the item flows to, through the peer review and revisions uh, process. At that point, then, the publisher sends the author um, the metadata about their item once it's been accepted, and they send them the, um, the version that's accepted. That goes off to the author, but hopefully it also goes off to other places as well. And I've listed here, um, far too small, um, the different data that um, should be chugging around by then, that we've got the acceptance date, we've got the DOI, because that's been given at acceptance, um, hasn't it? And um, we've got the article ID and all the, all the orchids coming in, we've got the fund ref ID and hopefully the grant number with a bit of luck. So all that stuff is beginning to come together, all those identifiers are coming together at that point and the thing which is the article is the article plus its metadata. And it could be sent out to services such as Orchid and Crossref and Gisgruta, which, you know, will be coming online soon, fingers crossed. And from that point, all that stuff, the metadata and the item, somehow ends up in the repository, either because the author has received it and they can just easily pump it in and we've got the DOI and everything so it can easily go in, or it could come via other routes, either Gisgruta or something else. Um, the embargo details, uh, I would like to come via uh, Sherpa, where I see, in an ideal world, all publishers are keeping Sherpa up to date with their information, and hopefully that will happen at some point, and we can harvest that metadata from Sherpa. And the identifiers underpin all of this. So we've still got some way to go with this. DOIs and acceptance are becoming more of a reality. Um, you will have seen the Crossref 
um, information recently. And some publishers, I know OUP, are beginning to adopt uh, DOIs at acceptance and hopefully more will as well. And what we would like is that with that DOI um, on acceptance, that we also have a facility where the intent to publish, um, which is tagged with the DOI, when it becomes published, then that flag can then come to the repository so that we know that something has been published, because as you all know, identifying publication date is quite tricky. So have we had actually a culture change? Um, well... The drivers over the last three or four years have definitely been compliance. We've heard a lot about that. And what we want to do now is really promote this message of open access as a good thing. And I've been very heartened to hear a lot of that going on in other institutions as well, that we're moving away from this idea that you just have to do this because somebody is telling you that you'll be very naughty if you don't. And our university open access statement does at the moment, I think, rather focus on compliance. I think this is, um, we're getting to a time where it's becoming ripe for reviewing this and looking more at um, why we might want to do open access as a university um, other than for compliance. We have come a long, long way in the last few years. I would say we've come a long, long way in the last few months since we launched Act on Acceptance. The communications has been key and researchers are reporting that the process is very easy. The processes really need streamlining even more, even though we're, we are beginning to, to sort of identify pinch points where we can uh, we can reduce time spent on these things and make it much more efficient. We'll have to see how the deposit rate evolves. You know, will people continue to keep putting in their back catalogues of things? And we keep telling them, you know, there are brownie points for putting in other items as well as um, articles and conference papers. Um, I don't know how people will take up that. Um, the technical development, um, as well as all this activity with the compliance and all that, we're also at the same time, typical isn't it, we're running a huge infrastructure review for our repository. Our repository uh, went live in 2007. It's now 2016 and it's looking a little bit long in the tooth. So we've been taking a, a, a big look at the repository systems and how it's all working and um, the infrastructure underpinning it and we're at the point now where we're beginning to think about with, with a big report how we move forward from here for next generation um, Oxford University Research Archive. A lot of external um, developments are, are affecting all of this and we're <laughs> trying very hard to keep up all of that whilst reviewing our infrastructure, whilst getting everybody going. Um, and the automation, as I've already mentioned, is something which we see as key to be able to manage this system efficiently. We need to be seen to be efficient. We cannot um, increase our expanding team of people to work on this. We have to work with existing staff. Much as it would be nice to have a, you know, an army of 50 people working on this, it ain't going to happen. So we have to be efficient. And we will continue to um, open up the discussion around research dissemination and scholarly communications um, across the piece. So in conclusion, yes, we've got a simple message and it seems to be working. We um, are streamlining the service. That's work in progress and much still to do. And transformational results. Yeah, I think we're on the, the right track. Um, again, still more to do, but as you've seen from the graph of increasing deposits, I think we're on the right track there. Thank you.